All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Karpinka, and I am the event coordinator for McNally Robinson Booksellers in Saskatoon. Tonight's event is coming to you from Treaty 6 Territory, the traditional lands of the Cree, Soto, Dene, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and Métis Nations. Special hello to anyone joining us through the live stream from home, and for all of you who are here in person, thank you for joining us as well. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Saskatoon launch of The Sweetest Dance on Earth by Di Brandt and Fly Away by Sarah Enns. Thank you to Di and Sarah for being here tonight. I'd also like to thank Turnstone Press and especially Sharon Caseberg for working with us to create this event. We also have a special guest host for the evening, Catherine Lawrence. Catherine is the author of three poetry collections, including her recent collection, Black Umbrella, which won the John B. Hicks Long Manuscript Award. Her previous book of poetry, Nevermind, was nominated for the Saskatchewan Book of the Year and the City of Saskatoon Book Award. She has won the North American Gold Moonbeam Award for Children's Poetry, was nominated for two Saskatchewan Book Awards, Poetry and Children's Literature, and won the Saskatchewan Book Awards Brenda McDonald Bridge's Best First Book Award. We will now hear from Catherine. Please give her a warm welcome. Thank you to Turn Stone. Always grateful for this. It's a great pleasure to be here honoring both of you. I first met Sarah. This is not about me, but I have to try to personalize the intro. So <laughs> I first met Sarah online when you were the editorial assistant at, at Turnstone. So it was an email from Sarah that let me know that they were going to publish. Never mind. So I immediately just fell in love with Sarah when we did that. <laughs> and bonded forever. <laughs> And then um, uh, a few years later, she came to see me when I was writer residence at the library because she was thinking about doing her MFA in creative writing here, and she wanted to know what I thought. And as soon as as soon as she sat down and started to talk, I thought, "We need this woman here. <laughs> Come to Saskatoon." And then I was so disappointed when she went back home. <laughs> Yeah, you can't keep her. <laughs> we couldn't keep her. That's what I understood. Anyway, um, home is central to Sarah's writing. She is based uh, in Treaty One Territory in Winnipeg, and she is a writer who has found her stride, and it's marvelous to read, uh, Sarah. Flyway is one long, gorgeous poem that is absolutely beautiful. It's breathtaking. It follows Sarah's Mennonite heritage through time and space to present-day Manitoba. The book begins in a sliver of tall grass prairie preserve near her hometown of Landmark, Manitoba. And the location is home to the last 1% of tall grass prairie on this earth. So just let that sink in. This fact has really disturbed Sarah, and so of course she has brought all of this distress to her writing. She knows how humans can transform this environment. Uh, Flyway is her second book. Uh, her poetry and nonfiction have appeared in numerous publications throughout North America. Um, if you ever get a chance to read uh, the essay that she won in the Edna Stabler personal essay contest in 2019, Entangled. Mm -hmm. Do <laughs> that's all I'll say. Do. Uh, her debut collection of poetry, The World's Most of Sky, is a stunner. It was shortlisted for the 2021 McNally Robinson of the Year Award and the 2022 Lansdowne Prize for Poetry. She has a BFA from UBC and, of course, an MFA from here. Um, Sarah, just to quote a line from one of your poems and bring you up, I'll quote Tell in this dry place some small story. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. And thank you to McNally. And thank you to everyone here. Um, I wrote this book in Saskatoon, as Catherine was saying, as part of this MFA. 
degree and it's really really exciting to um to bring it back here and to get to be here thanks obviously to die for coming here with me and um yeah for all the ways we've gotten to share poetry over the past few years um so as Catherine was saying this is a long poem it's about uh it's about home. And so part of it is set in the present day, what's left of the tall grass prairie in Treaty One. And part of it goes back in time um, and follows my Oma's migration from Ukraine to Manitoba um, after and during the Second World War. Um, and it's sort of looking at, uh, you know, that Mennonite settlement, um, that, that Mennonites, as they were fleeing their their homes, um, there was also there's also displacement that occurs of other people, right? Every time Mennonites would flee their homes and arrive somewhere else, there were original people who were living there um, that were then being displaced. So it's sort of tracing this um, this sort of complicated question of home and how we make home and what does it mean to um, to create home in new places. So that's kind of the spiel about flyway. Um, I'm going to read right from the beginning and then uh, pick up a few of those other threads. Prelude. There is this place, this patch of tall grass, a grassland of blue stem, wheat grass, prairie cord grass tall to my shoulders, hardy bunch grass swaying. I'd never thought much about grass until I came to this place, but here the thought of grass is inescapable. Everywhere in numerous thrones, dominions of grass bending. 6,000 square kilometers of tall grass once ran along the Red River Valley. Imagine, less than 1% remains. What remains? This small place, this preserve here. It survives along a flyway, a flight path between breeding and wintering grounds, spanning continents and oceans, stringing together places like this. So the birds, too, I notice here. Warblers, swallows, meadowlarks, migratory birds who rely on this place. My gaze tumbles from sky to shrub, poorly tracking flutters and specks and song. Not knowing, I hunch under clouds, blustery light falling into the grass. I am here to think about grass and birds, to ask and look and listen. I am here a descendant of Mennonite settlers in the land of the Anishinaabe, Assiniboine, Dakota, and Cree, the homeland of the Métis. Mennonites, a people displaced, displacing. So goes the story carried from Switzerland, South Germany, Netherlands, Austria, Hungary, hung Hungary, Poland, Prussia, Ukraine. Some stories follow you your whole life and spill out in front of you, flight paths well worn. Here we stayed, the Mennonites, converting tall grass to farmland and claiming it as home. Many voices burble under rising threat, overwhelming peril. They hum in the grass. And here I am listening. And here I am with this story. So I'm going to pick up um, to the section called Flight, which takes place from 1929 to 1945. Um, and it tells the story of how my Oma left Ukraine. Kronstall, Soviet Ukraine. The first Lydia came loud and red, fists and feet. Mother hurt my wrist squeezing, her skirt hitched to hips, until the midwife caught the slipping baby, pronounced her girl, sister, everything I'd been hoping. Then Lydia's body filled with lead. The eldest at six, my job became strapping her to a narrow wooden board, careful to mind her lolling. I practiced Russian or sang her the old songs, while Hans, only four, rubbed her hair, her bright, wet mouth. He cried when she moaned, so I kept her from him, never left her on the floor, felt her eyes sweep the flesh of my face. The first Lydia lived two years and died before the killing hunger. That year, Peter came, our little boy in blue. Spring, everything mud. The minister helped mother move Lydia board to box, father upright in the grave. The minister prayed in our language and my shoulders ached with the memory of her weight. And I do not remember release, only that the second Lydia rolled, sat up, held my fingers. 
When I rocked her, I cooed, Lita, and that year our churches closed. Mother often cried behind the house. Hunger taught us to wake slowly, to lift as if from water. If you did not starve, hunger taught you to watch and wait. If you did not starve, the stone of your stomach turned traitor. Father was waiting, but I do not know who pointed the police at him. I know mother screamed once. I thought I saw them shoot him in the head. I didn't hear anything. I saw my father on his knees, father's anger, a storm I knew, kneeling. He took with him the Bible from the kitchen table and mother ran to the neighbors to borrow money and told me, Ani, stay. So from the door, I watched my father walk the road to the black raven full of men. He did not look up at the night. Mother pressed her face into his hands. Lita, from her cradle, howling. In the kitchen, mother stood, bent over the stove and shook. I got sick and the village emptied of men. The black raven ate them all. Um, so at a certain point, um, my Oma and her family are, are forced to leave their village in Ukraine. Um, and there's some, um, some bombing that's happening. So they're at this point, they're in a, in a bunker. Beneath the oak of Kortitsa, outside the bunker, an oak and some girls gathered under its canopy, old arms twisting cathedral, head rolled back against bark. A Ukrainian girl said her people had come to these roots for generations and generations, worshiped here, sought sanctuary. Almost all men and half the women and children gone from the villages east of the Dnieper. My cousin hugged her knees to her chin, found an acorn folded in the fabric of her dress. I held her wrist, cool, a pulse, a proverb, bullets in bursts from the bridge. Tree trembling, terror, a long river cringing through the earth. So eventually, um, my Oma, her mother, and her little sister Lita do make it out, but she loses um, both of her brothers and her father. Um, and I'm gonna pick up again from the section Unsettling, um, which follows some of those early days um, of them arriving in this village. The humble hands of Christ prepare the table, knead, hold flood fields from the pulpit. The story goes, I should say the village in Manitoba. They've now arrived in Manitoba. <laughs> That's important. The story goes, Ani sat herself on the corner of his dark, heavy desk, watched him grade papers in fine red pen. The story goes, she plucked a piece of candy from a small glass bowl, twirled a hard, sweet circle from plastic crinkling. The story goes, she learned to know Gerhard, the stern, shy, school teacher preacher, the village's most eligible bachelor. Born eldest son of Gerhard G. H. Entz, born then moved in 1923 along with 20,000 other Ruslander Mennonites to further settle Canadian prairie. The Canadian Mennonite Board of Colonization immigrant founded by an earlier wave of fleeing farming Mennonites to coordinate this coming of Christ followers to tell the martyr legacy war, revolution, war, hunger, exile, an inheritance of turning to earth, resisting the world, learning to lean your body from flesh through ice to carry your enemy safe to shore, this shore of rich soil sh shored up and tilled under a promised wind-blown emptied land to cultivate with conviction, though enemies everywhere, so safeguard the spirit and forego despair, the sparrow, there, see and know the Lord watching cover your hair. She misses dancing. She misses almost nothing but the dancing. In fine dirt, a crocus and a child on her hands and knees shrieks full to the earth, purple. 
in just a few hot months, the beets will need digging, the beans will need picking, the church aching and sweating. It's either quiet or not at all quiet. Head first like a nuthatch, follow the flash pattern of the field, watch the conscience of a practical people, a people persecuted, set apart, saved, reborn safe in parceled prairie, prairie set apart, stolen, for settler hands driving plowshares deep into ancestral grounds. The teachings of Christ. Do not adorn your flesh. Do not take up arms. Do not swear an oath. Avoid the country fair. Their tractor shows no card games or drink or sex or smoke. So cling to the anguish of the faith stories. Remember with holy severity. This is God's own truth. This is a crowbar. This is your salvation. And I'll close. Um, so between these sections, there's this thread that takes place in the tall grass, and it's called the tall grass psalmody. Um, so I'll close with uh, that last, that last part. What story are you telling? Whose? I will try to tell the truth. I say, crouching to pluck the broken blood feather from its slimy net of reeds. Look how skin like wax sheaths the hollow quill. Lift your head and look. Will you join the chorus? An ongoing trill follows the fringe of burr oak and black ash, stirs up the overcast. Oh, downtrodden stray, scrambling for purchase on a soft ridge of song. This journey winds through you as guide. Once, I held out my hand and a nuthatch picked a peanut from my palm, its feet both sharp and light, its body fleeting and full, and I think, if nothing else, I can hold myself still enough to brush, even briefly, against this presence, airborne and tipping my whole face to the rain. After many minutes listening, savannah sparrow, clay-colored sparrow, red-winged blackbird, brown-headed cowbird, western meadowlark, morning dove. Birds, like poems, follow the river. Thank you. See what I mean? <laughs> yeah, wow. Wow, it's great. <laughs> Absolutely. So much music. So much music. Wow. Thank you. I didn't tell you the collegial relationship that exists here, which is that uh, Sarah and I have some history. Uh, Sarah is the editor of The Sweetest Dance on Earth. Di edited Black Umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> Goes on and on. Di and Sarah share Mennonite traditions among many, many things from different communities. And Di, this is my way into introducing to Di. Di um, got me turned around with poetry about 20 years ago at Sage Hill where I first met her, did a workshop with her. And I was, you know, I had little kids and I was so estranged from poetry. And she just set me on my path and soon my first book came out. And I just always felt this huge attachment to her. So when when Sharon at Turnstone asked me if if how I felt about Di Grant editing Black Umbrella it was an email. I think I just laughed right out loud in my office. Like, what? How do I feel? Yes, yes. So it was a great experience. She pushed and she pushed hard in that in the best sense. So the sweetest dance on earth is um, such an important book, and we're so lucky to have Di with us tonight because. Um, I just feel like this is a celebration. Thank you, both of you, for putting this together. To have to have forty years of Di Brandt in one two slim volume. When I when I when I got a hold of this book, I went through seeing like, well, how, what's in here, and how on earth did they not put in this poem and that poem and that poem? <laughs> that question might come back to you. <laughs> Page count. <laughs> Page count. That's great. <laughs> So this is um, her, her, her newest collection, as I've said, and um, it reminds us all, I think, of Di's enormous contribution to the creation of literature in this country. She stands tall, and I feel like I personally owe her a debt of gratitude, and we all owe her a great debt of gratitude. 
putting this introduction together was very challenging for me because <laughs> because my first couple of drafts looked like they just read like a like a love fest and I thought oh gosh I can I can't let everybody not not know what kind of credentials this woman brings to poetry because she is the real deal so her voice is I believe uh, one that explains our world to us that's a huge statement I know I I, I think you'll find the same thing when you dip into this her voice is filled with enormous love and great despair. And I sit alone reading these poems and they make me weep. They break my heart. They just do. Many of you know Di, she was a writer in residence here in town last year. Sadly, she couldn't come and live in Saskatoon because of the pandemic, but she, uh, she did her magic online. And I tell you, the workshops just flew, like she cut a swath through this community from home. Those of you who don't know the details of Di's background, she grew up in Rhineland, uh, a Mennonite farming village just so in southern Manitoba near Winkler. And here's another little connection. So Di's high school principal was Sarah's grandfather. I got that right? I do. Goes on and on. And he grew up in the, the same village. <laughs> yeah, and he grew up in the same village. Okay. <laughs> Speaking of the deep roots of, we know progress. everything about each other. We know everything about each other. That's right. That's right. Including the Bible inside of it. Her first volume of poetry, Questions I Asked My Mother, uh, was published in Turnstone in six in eighty seven, and it became a Canadian bestseller. She's gone on to publish seven more volumes of poetry, as well as essays and literary criticism. And her work has been adapted for television and radio and video and dance and sculpture and theater and even the bees have gotten involved. <laughs> yeah, you should be that. <laughs> Di has taught Canadian literature and creative writing all over the world and she continues to teach. I don't know how you keep doing that, Di. Um, a particular note is her the position she held at Brandon University from 2005 to, to 2011, where she held the first Canada Research Chair in Literature and Creative Writing. Her work expanded the influence of poetry as an important form of research and mode of creative and critical thinking. In 2018, she became the first poet laureate of Winnipeg. There's so many firsts associated with this woman. She held it for a year and two years ago. <laughs> two years, two years, and many of the of the, of the poems she wrote, love sonnets to Winnipeg, for example, are, are in here. They're beautiful. And then a couple of years later, she was awarded an honorary doctorate by McEwen University. It's a great honor. She has either won or been nominated for every major award in this country. And I want to bring particular attention to her nomination for the 2004 Griffin Award for now. For now, you care. I decided I wanted to cite this um, honor among her many because now you care seems to me even more relevant and more urgent than it was even 18 years ago. Read it, buy it. It's it's a necessary book, but there are only six poems in here for now you care. <laughs> what do you mean? There's all the gossips. Well, <laughs> Well, true. Doesn't. <laughs> I, since I want more. <laughs> She's always been ahead of her time in terms of her subjects and her preoccupations and her sense of urgency. Hers is a voice that says, pay attention. It's a voice that continues to speak up and thank God it does. Thank God she's still being published. Thank you, Turnstone. It is my huge, huge heart's delight to welcome you. <laughs> Well, I'm so bowled over by this <laughs> lavish introduction. I think it's the most lavish introduction anybody's ever given me. Thank you so much. That's what you're um, <laughs> <laughs> It's so great to be here. Thank you to McNally Robert, uh, Robinson Bookstores for existing and to uh, Turnstone Press uh, for uh, existing. <laughs> it's, it's a heroic job now to be small 
a small press, a literary press. I think it's actually a heroic job for the big presses too. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't all be the mouth and trying to all become one. Um, <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> Let's not go there. No. Um, yeah, and thank you to Saskatoon. Um, I've been sent on so many. Um, the reason it was such a long introduction is because I've been around for so long. <laughs> Hard to su summarize it all. But uh, I've been sent on many of many book tours and uh, from Winnipeg, and I uh, always started here, either here or Regina. So I've always thought of Sask uh, Saskatchewan as my, you know, sort of second home in that way, and uh, always received the first, you know, sort of the first from away uh, responses from from readers here, and it was a, always a very wonderful experience and a, a really important one for me. So it's so nice to see you all here. Now again, <laughs> um, so uh, I thought it would be easy to do a new and selected because I thought you know just cherry pick your favorite poems from like past collections. Already did the work. Already went through the, all the anguish. <laughs> <laughs> already faced the reviews, you know, and you just just cherry pick them and then put them together and add a few new ones at the end. But uh, I found it quite a wrenching experience. Uh, it was uh, partly because of taking the poems out of their context, out of their their, their hers, historical, personal context, and out of the, the, their literary context, made me realize how much all my poems have been like part of a, a particular project each time. And so taking them out of there and putting them in a new context was like, oh my God, now, plus we're living in such a different time now than when some of those poems were written. So it was like, what? What have I done <laughs> with my life? <laughs> uh, so it ended up being kind of a, a life review. Um, oh. uh, <laughs> it's a painful thing to go through, you know. What did I do? <laughs> what have I done? Uh, it's good for people, though, you know. <laughs> I recommend it, <laughs> even though it's really hard to do. And um, you know, it wasn't end of life life review. I'm still here. Yeah, I'm still alive. <laughs> still writing books. So I get to start, I feel like I get to start over now, having put a kind of a frame around this whole book. Uh, so it's called The Sweetest Dance on Earth. Um, and uh, so I'll ask you, what do you think is the sweetest dance on earth? Uh, so I've been going around asking people, people have the most interesting ideas and uh, a diverse answers. Uh, a lot of dancing in the world, even though there's a lot of uh, hard things to deal with as well. Uh, I don't know if despair, Catherine, but <laughs> um, maybe um, worry <laughs> that we all have. <clears throat> uh, but yeah, trying to add some dancing to it and some, you know, so we had trouble coming up with a, with a, a cover that would live up to an extravagant promise like the sweetest dance on earth. <laughs> and so, um, so we tried several different ones and, you know, uh, it's, that's not the sweetest dance on earth. It was just really hard to figure out how to do that. So, um, uh, and finally, I thought of you know my mother's embroidery practice. You know how the mothers in my village they embroidered all the pillowcases and they embroidered uh, you know hangings for the wall and these beautiful flowers. So that was kind of the principle for the for the for the cover. Uh, my editor was Sarah, and uh, she was a. Uh, 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 an astonishing editor who had, a, you know, she had the entire oeuvre in her head <laughs> more than I did, I think. <laughs> and she, uh, and she was, uh, yeah, she was wonderful. She was very uh, compassionate and also very uh, passionate. So that was that was lovely. And it was a harder, I think, a harder gig than either of us had sort of thought of. And part of what was hard, she made it harder because. <laughs> Than it already was because she, because of this connection that we have, this intergenerational connection we have, you know, to my village, it was a new experience for me to actually. It's a new experience to have another woman poet from that, from so the, the southern Manitoba Mennonite community at all, and to to and to um, uh, be able to talk with somebody on a deep level about uh, the, the the whole that whole. Uh, that whole trajectory and actually know that you understand it for sort of a sort of experiential uh, place. So that sort of changed my life quite a lot. 
to have that experience and it made it it made it more painful but it also made it more sweet <laughs> all at the same time <laughs> so I'll just jump around a little bit we get something from the beginning something from the middle something from the end um and um uh yeah we couldn't put everything in so we you know we we said okay we didn't have to put in every good poem we there's some there's some good poems that didn't make it in and, but those other books aren't dead, you know. They're still all this is just an ad for all those other books as well, right? So, anyway. <laughs> I know some of you have them on your shelves, maybe. Uh, okay, so let's start. Let's start in the village. Uh, when I was five, I thought heaven was located in the hayloft of our barn. The ladder to get up there was straight and narrow, like the Bible said. If you fell off, you might land on the horns of a cow or be smashed on cement. The men in the family could leap up in seconds, wielding pitchforks. My mother never even tried. For us children, it was hard labor. I was the scaredy. I couldn't reach the first rung. So I stood at the bottom and imagined what heaven was like there was my grandfather with his Santa Claus beard, sitting on a wooden throne among straw bales, never saying a word, but smiling and patting us on the head and handing out bubblegum to those who were good. Even though his eyes were half closed, he could see right inside your head. So I squirmed my way to the back of the line and unwished the little white lie I had told, which I could feel growing grimy up there and tried not to look at the dark gaping hole where they shoved out black sinners like me. But the best part was the smell of new pitched hay wafting about. Some of it fell to where I stood under the la ladder. There were tiny blue flowerets pressed on dry stems. I held them to my nose and breathed deep sky and sun. It was enough heaven for me for one day. My mother found herself one late summer afternoon, lying in grass under the wild yellow plum tree, jeweled with sunlight. She was forgotten there in spring, picking rhubarb for pie, and the children home from school hungry, and her new dress half hemmed for Sunday. The wind and rain made her skin ruddy like a peach, her hair was covered with wet fallen crabapple blossoms. She didn't know what to do with her, so she put her up in the pantry among glass jars of jellied fruit. She might have stayed there all winter, except we were playing robbers and the pantry was jail, and every caught thief of us heard her soft moan. She made her escape while we argued over who broke pickled watermelon jars, scattering cubes of pale pink flesh in vinegar over the basement floor. My mother didn't mind. She handed us mop and broom smiling and went back upstairs. I think she was listening to herself in the wind, singing. Um, now I'm going to move to a little bit, skip ahead a little bit. Uh, so this is three poems for Agnes. One, you count the 10 ways of saving Agnes. You recite them to yourself in the night, bake a chocolate cake, call the priest, find her sister, not the one in River Heights, the younger one in, in River, you think, somewhere in St. Patel with crutches, walking the dog, chatting across the veranda, the weather, the mosquitoes, her dead mother, her heart listening to the ragged story one more round spiraling toward the black hole in the round ignoring the pink man and the cabbie and the beer your arm around her just this once eye to eye without wincing hold your breath christmas turkey apple pie careening down jesse giddily the old streetcar name desire oh blanche blanche two and then you remember the broken engagement the crystal laid out on the mahogany table the candles, the lace, you remember the ticket office at the train station and the soldiers back from the war. How he held her among the crowd, his arm proud, his breath on her cheek. Our Agnes panting her love on Main Street, face flushed and no priest. How she waited all those months and years after Christmas with her prayers and her beads and how she finally heard from her sister about the disabled child in California growing up American. God's punishment for an afternoon sin on the beach, though he still loved her, Agnes, not the other. It could have been you. The, late, the way he let her tell everyone in Winnipeg graciously, it was her wish. Oh, 
her endless forgiving and her spirits and her priest and no one to care about the story now, Agnes, not even you. Three, and suddenly you want desperately to believe in her angels and her saints, their satin robe shining somewhere above Jupiter. You want her to have found a place in some holy choir, the Virgin blessing heaven with her tears. You want for Agnes in the sky, some bright holy prince caressing her broken spirit bones into light. All the desperate nights on earth forgotten. You find yourself standing on the corner in front of her house at dusk, clasping your hands. Strange, you should miss her so when you've agreed with the rest. She's much better off dead when your neighbor's so much younger and lively. Agnes in the sky with diamonds. I'm going to read this poem, which I don't read that often, but it's called Wedding Poem for Phyllis, 1989. Um, so, so I had just gone through a, a very terrible, uh, extremely uh, uh, hurtful uh, divorce. And a friend of mine was getting married for the second time, and she said, can you please write a poem for your wedding? And I was like, oh, I cannot write a poem for your wedding. It's, I'm just a total wreck from my divorce. And then I thought that was so wonderful that she asked me this impossible, you know, for, set me this impossible task. And I actually sort of enjoyed trying to stand up to tall enough to to write it and read it at her wedding. So this is Wedding Home for Phyllis, 1989. So much easier to talk about forever when you're 19 and still believe in roses and the world is your father's house. You think you will escape by staying up all night dancing with younger men. And the answer to your mother's crease-lined face and shabby linen and faded hair is love transforming everything into gold. <laughs> so much easier to slide into household dust and diapers and car rust with your nose buried in a bouquet and your eyelids delicately shaded. Yet you remember nothing from those years that wasn't hard work, including the stories we told over coffee, the way we twisted ourselves mornings around full and empty lives, inventing our escape. Finding yourself in a garden once more with your children carrying roses. You turn the word love over curiously on your tongue. This time, not a running away or a leaping, but a promise made wide-eyed in daylight with the knowledge of time and loss and hurt in your hands, a stretching toward the horizon tenderly of darling and forever. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I will go since you mentioned bees. I'm going to read the poem for the bees. So, Agony, the big people they all know her work, she's a very famous installation artist of Winnipeg. And she uh, she was doing all this stuff with the with, uh, paraffin wax. And then she ran out of paraffin wax. And so she started working with beeswax. And I was like, wait, bees. Then she started working with the bees. And then she said, uh, ask me if I would write a poem for her bees. And she said, the bees can, uh, and she was going to translate it into Braille and then give it to the bees to reply to. Because uh, she said they, they started off their honeycomb with these little dots that look just like Braille and they work in the dark. So they read them just like Braille. Uh, so I thought that was wonderful. So I spent a summer uh, hanging out in, uh, this was at the St. Norbert Art Center uh, just outside of Winnipeg and out where I was staying for the summer. And that's where her bees were. So it's been a summer, you know, sort of trying to shrink myself to bee size and to see the world from a point of view of a bee, which was very interesting, you know, like they don't make a distinction between cultivated and wild flowers, for example, just whichever ones are the nicest, right? And just what is their neighborhood and so on. And then I, I, I took it totally literally. It was like, you know, I'm writing this poem and the bees are going to read it and, uh, uh, <laughs> And then I got really scared, you know, like, could I possibly want to say as an ambassador from this <laughs> really destructive species that is harming their environments and the earth so much. And so I, I thought I should write a poem that is really abject and guilty, and, you know, an apology. <laughs> So that's what I was trying to work towards. But at the same time, I was living in that flower garden and <laughs> eating their delicious honey. And, and then when I was finally ready to write my home, it wasn't at all the 
what I had intended. I I felt it, it was like it was like a shamanic journey, you know. I just I felt inhabited by the bees. I became a bee. So this is interspecies communication, and then everything goes bee sun exploding into green, the mad skydive through shards of diamond light, earth veering left then right then left, sweet scented the honing in the buzz. The yes no dance the quantum leap into open swoon of calendula yellow orange delphinium star flower ultraviolet milkweed forget me not caress of corolla carpal calyx sharp tongue flick into nectar um lost my place here delicious rub of belly against silk shudder of pollen heavy thighs the long, slow sip of honeymead, sigh of sated petals in the wind. The drunken stagger, high word, confused weave through chlorpyrithus, malathion, ribboned corridors of poisoned insect less late afternoon air. Grown bee, dumbledore, hum of bee, the familiar rush, swarm, crawl of bee on bee on bee on bee. Centuries, warriors, scouts, promiscuous, architects, sculptors, whimsical, perfectionists, singers, nurses, studs. This honeymoon home, take a minute This droning harem, this feminine monarchy, the mother deep in her dark cell, quivering, licked and adored. O oh, mother bride, O oh, queen of earth and sky, O oh, goddess. At the end of this dark century of human destruction and despair, as always, a joyful, delirious, magic flowered honey love. <laughs> That's what I learned from the bees. Is uh, you know, when in when in doubt, when in anxiety, eco anxiety, make more honey. <laughs> and I think it changed my life, changed my thought, right, and changed my poetic practice. You know? Um, this is called Walking to Mojacar. Mojacar is in southern Spain, where I spent a lovely, delicious month at an international writer's retreat. It was Lorca country. So the feel, you, you didn't have to go through the zone there where you say, you know, what is a poem again? And who am I writing this for? And how do you do it again? Uh, you just slurped it up in the fields and you just wrote it down. <laughs> So this is walking to Mohantar. Along the winding car-studded new highways of the still rosemary-scented Andalusian hills, the poets wander, bewildered, out of time, flayed by the centuries' losses weighing heavy on them, herds of invisible sky sheep driven by wind. On the lip of ragged colina overlooking the sea, bright red canciones spring from jutted rock. Not for a moment, Federico Garcia Lorca, not for a moment, dark-eyed leopard, lovely lover, are you alone who charmed the serpents of the Hudson River into Camellia starred weaving, who wept loud and long over the crucified bones of the world's tortured boymen, wrapped on gray, steel-girded street corners, scattered, shivering on brown bombshell beaches. You gave us fireflies over New York, blue flyer. You gave us blue fly fireflies over New York. You saw the sky flee before the black plumes of smoke and tumult of windows. You insisted on dancing among columns of blood. Half the world is sand, you said, the other half mercury. You were lightning flashing in between. We taste ashes in our mouths, Federico. The tourists are pissed in the wells. The olive trees are drying up. Fly back to us across the implacable Atlantic. Bring along your dark doves, masks, roses, little eagles. Uh, the poetic sublocation, I wrote that in Spain. So fly back to us across the Atlantic was from New York when I spent some time. But then when I came back here, it was fly back to us from Spain. <laughs> <laughs> the big Atlantic ocean and the gap it has caused in us all. If we were from, uh, if we were coming from the other side to Canada, um, this is called River People, and it's dedicated to Thompson and Raymond Thompson Highway, dear friend and his lovely partner Raymond and all. 
Um, so uh, thinking about all the different places I've lived in and all the different, I uh, had a very adventurous life. I just got to travel all over the world and I've also lived in many interesting and very diverse places. And uh, um, and I was trying to think about them in terms of um, uh, land practice. So we're used to thinking about, you know, ident talking about identity now as a sort of a personal thing. But, um, you know, having grown up in the peasant village, <laughs> land practice is everything. Huh? <laughs> okay, this is called river people. I have come now to live with the river people. I was raised among the earth, proud dirt under the fingernails, long, rugged, silent days of pulling and plowing electric barbed wire to keep the cows in, tin granaries bulging with bright wheat, bright orange carrots rooted improbably, juicy green feather topped in cracked black soil. Meadowlarks perched on the fence posts along the gravel road, announcing in the morning with their cheery trilling song. I lived with the lake people for a while, sand colored beaches, blue gray water, sparkling sky, no fixed borders anywhere. Ground squirrels darting through the bushes, the slow putt, putt, putt of the weather beaten gray aluminum boat, pungent smell of rotted fish, rustle of dead mayflies, flash of white wings and sharp beaks, shots ringing out. Midnight feast for the whole clan, too much drink, aurora borealis painting the night sky and the moon, the moon. There were the years I lived with the asphalt and cement people, dedicated to glass and steel and cars and money and speed. Pinstriped linen suits over crisp white cuffs, tooled leather briefcases, color-coded digital presentations in fashionable PowerPoint. Statistics, analyses, tables, maps, reports. Hurry, hurry. Faster, faster, more, more. Belgian raspberry cider and gold-rimmed glasses, yachts and sailboats on the canal parched ditches, car accidents, the singing stars muffled behind inky clouds. There were the years I lived in the air, crowded cabins with TV screens built into the seat backs, dinners on plastic trays, smiling servants everywhere, lipstick, pantyhose, eyeshadow, stilettos, yellow turbans and hand embroidered slippers, passports, hotel reservations, wait lines, security checks, fresh squeezed orange juice for breakfast, Crisp papaya salad for lunch, pina colada, ambassadorial receptions, keynote addresses, interviews, pictures, and newspapers. I have come now to live with river people. We sit on the reedy shore and watch the water flow by, urgently, purposefully, carrying the continent's pulse and debris firmly along the bay we have heard about on the edge of a mythical northern ocean with seal mermaids and melting ice flows far away. We watch the people living on the other side with their bigger yards and lusher gardens and louder dinner parties, knowing we live on a superior, wilder, slower, freer side. <laughs> Don't we? And they, do they feel pity or envy looking across at us, perched on our unadorned rocks our, with our fishing lines and ragged, sprawling nettle and burdock groves? We chat with the geese. We watch the sun's reflection as it's going down along wavering red lines slashing the water. We sing to the fish. We scatter many colored flower petals to the spirit bones of our beloved remember drowned, the overdose, the lost, the disappeared. The deep hearts cry of why, 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 why. We pick wild berries, sumac, raspberry, blackberry on the shore. The smoke of our tiny backyard fires, tobacco lips, spirals upward toward the heavens. My fingers begin to remember how to weave willow baskets and bright colored shawls. My lips begin to mutter the old songs and the old languages, my tongue curling gingerly around the strange and familiar sounds. I begin to hear the verbal the babble and the gurgle, the glue, glue, glue at the earth's deep core. My mind begins to wander the swirling galaxies. What could I possibly want more? More <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I'm going to just move this to one side because um, we want to we want to have a few minutes of conversation. Um, I'm happy to kick off a question, um, but honestly, the floor is open. Don't be shy. Uh, we'd love to hear what you think is uh, the sweetest dance on earth. Okay, we're moving to the soft chair. <laughs> we're moving into the soft chairs. That's where I'm going. So what do we both think of the things? Okay. Oh, and I'm sorry, just click that button on the front and I'll There we go. Okay. Well, like I'm on like some late night TV show. <laughs> Thank you, Di and Sarah. It was beautiful and overwhelming. And I'm so curious about your collaboration. Mm. Mm, so, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know that Di just said to us that she felt, um, or you just said to us, Di, that you felt understood. Uh, in working with Sarah, which I think is has got to be one of the most beautiful compliments anyone could, could pay another person to be understood uh, is what is what I go through my life wanting. <laughs> um, Sarah, what about you? Um, what did, what was your takeaway from working so closely with with Di, with Di's work? Um, which part are we gonna tell? <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell. Well, I mean it was a similar when when Turnstone said, you know, would you like to take on this immense project? Uh, I emailed similarly of just yes, um, because I, it was first reading Dai's work, especially questions I asked my mother, that you know, I that was also a feeling of being understood, um, just reading her work, right? So it was um so I was really excited to uh, to now get to talk about all of these poems and to talk about how they might fit together in a different way and um, how they could represent, um, yeah, a life, a life of work. Um, yeah, and, and I guess we, we just got to have so many interesting conversations about poems, which is the best way to spend a day. So, <laughs> well, what's, yeah. your, what's your takeaway, Sarah, though? I mean, what did you, what have you learned about yourself or what how, do you see? I mean, working this closely with Di Brand is a rare, wonderful experience. Yeah. <laughs> so how do you see her coming up in your own work? Because she is, she's, you know, her, yeah. I, I, I hear her in, in both of your books. Yeah, I think I think the, the musicality of, of Di's poems like that, I, I, I mean, I think I've said this a lot of times, that questions I asked my mother was the first book of poetry I really loved, and I think it's sort of been the um, the grounding sound that I that I listen for when I'm writing my own my own work. Um, yeah, so the I think the Dai's poems they always have a singing quality, um, and so yeah, I think that's what I'm trying to listen for in my own work too. Right, but now correct me if I'm wrong, but a, a question I asked my mother was. Um, given to you by your father right <laughs> yeah when you were what about 16 yeah yeah so I think that's really uh worth thinking about <laughs> <laughs> because there you are at home uh and your father gives you this collection it couldn't be a, a more radically different experience from dying and what mm. your and your relationship with your father because where I'm what I'm thinking is that you had this tremendous permission yeah. that I didn't have at your age and well, stage of writing. So that was that was actually something that we talked about a lot, Diane and I, about the the legacy of this work, right? And how, um, yeah, this in a lot of ways, Di's books sort of opened the door for for other people to yeah, for other um, right. you know for other women um, mm -hmm. for for prairie literature for midnight literature. It did a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, this. this this feeling of, uh, 
you know, this this exists, and so now now I can say something too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. How's it, Lynn? You're done. <laughs> I mean, it's a it's a it's a tremendous legacy. Well, thank you for recognizing that. Um, so lavishly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I mean, I, uh, as you all know, like there was a very high price to pay for being the first Mennonite woman from Southern Manitoba to, from the traditional community that uh, my, my, uh, uh, parents, my ancestry is, uh, from the very traditional group, much more traditional than the Sarah's group. And uh, even though we did see really for some of the time, but uh, uh, yeah, it was uh, a, you know a million miles from there to you know it's like an hour and a half drive from my village to Winnipeg, but it's like a million miles in terms of how to get from this one sensibility and understanding of the world and all the teachings of it and all the all the all the restrictions of it, which were meant to protect the uh, that community from uh from the encroachment of modernity which it, it didn't actually wasn't able to do and at the time when i was growing up that was sort of part anyway so um uh despite their best efforts uh and so i was the person you know i just happened to be there in that in that place where you know at the front of that that, that wave of all that change and had to figure out how to talk about that. And yeah, there was a lot of uh, 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 backlash from the community at that time, even though, even though most everybody, so I mean, even though all those changes did happen, I was held responsible for having <laughs> made the changes or caused them um, when, in fact, I was just trying to make sense of them and document them. And, uh, you know, and like they happened to everybody really eventually. In one way or another. So, but still, it was very hard, and uh, in in many ways, I've not been forgiven by many people in that community for having done that. Uh, so that has been a, a painful thing in my life. And to have Sarah, who has these roots in my village and in my high school, uh, you know, come along and uh, and 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 show this understanding of, of the work and also just I felt I do feel like she's sort of a uh, you know an heir you know I'm, I feel like she's my literary daughter you know and um, or niece or something <laughs> and uh so uh and uh, and that uh, it, it was a very uh painful thing for me that was the painful thing of under of uh, like I felt like I can lay that down now, you know. It's like I've been forgiven or something. <laughs> it's it's like I've been understood now. So it's like it's like it it changed the story so much, and and then it was really painful because then you know, after that I could feel what it would have been like for them, you know, to be because I was getting this you know fancy university education and learning to uh, read books and uh, what is a book, you know, and. and to write books but for the people in my village they were uh from my family from that line they were uh still living in, you know they were living in the, in the middle ages and they didn't there was an oral culture and it was and it just it really you know it really sidelined them and uh, so i it was it was very beautiful to get to this place where i got to uh because of i think because of your understanding uh, to actually uh, an acceptance of the story and identification with it, even uh, to you know that I I was uh, able to that that it changed me completely. I feel like now I don't have to I don't have to do that battle anymore ever again. You know, so but that, it's just like who am I now? Well, I don't know if rest, but, you know, <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Anyway, it was a beautiful experience, but it was really hard. And fun. And lots of fun. We laughed all the time. We laughed a lot all the time when we were each other. Yeah. So then um, you, you said that, yeah. that so the, you know, the kind of summing up, a wrenching summing up, and now you're moving in another direction. What's that direction? 
Well, is it a direction? Because it's I've just been you know at home in the pandemic like everybody else. <laughs> it's not a direction. It's like it's just a place. It's a place, though. Um, you know, I I don't mean I, as you all know. I mean, it's really hard. All this about socializing, uh, social isolation has been really hard. But if you're a writer, there's also a fun part to it. Like you don't have to feel guilty about just wanting to sit there and. and fiddle with words in your head and on, the, on a page instead of going out and doing stuff, you know? <laughs> so I so I actually really enjoyed it a lot as well. And uh, But a lot of my writing in the past has been fueled by the adventure of, uh, you know, intercultural, you know, this this frisson of the intercultural uh, uh, bewilderment of uh, a, a long border of, that comes with crossing borders, which I saw, you know, I mean, that's where I started and then, and then I did that a lot I mean, elsewhere. Then I kept looking for that experience elsewhere in Spain and, uh, and elsewhere. And uh, so, uh, and just the, just this idea of like, I don't know, that you, uh, uh, that you get some of the energy right from, from, uh, from the new, you know, from the adventure of the new or the other, meeting the other. And so sitting at home in my backyard and not going anywhere, and I thought, okay, that's that's actually what I want to do now. I just want to sit, you know, sit there with, the, with my river people. Uh, I just want to sit there and I just want to put down roots really deep. And uh, and then I did. And then I, I felt like I got, for the first time in my life, but also intergenerationally, in many generations of my heritage, I would say, for the first time I felt uh, like I really uh, came to a sense of home. You know, there in my little backyard in uh, Winnipeg, beside the river. <laughs> so that's a big thing, you know, the same thing. And uh, Sarah's been writing about home as well. So, home, you know, for those of us who came to come up with uh, uh, stories, you know, it's a hard thing to get. Yeah. Are there any questions? You want to jump in? Because I, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, first of all, Catherine, I want to say what a little bit of a story. I took some workshops running a few years ago, and we always felt so well prepared and so thoughtful. And, and when you said, I did standard, I would like to go to the next level to the event. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. So I have a question for you. Um, I love that you've taken the story and made it. And I wonder if that was a question then about how, you know, how to tell that story. So that's one question. And the other one is it strikes me that you've done quite a bit of the story so thanks thanks Gabby. did everyone hear the question uh so correct me if i'm wrong but kathy's asking sarah about the amount of research that went into the book and also the first part of that question was, um, I'm just the choices she made along the way, yeah. Yeah. and moving, deciding to move into a long poem. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that the idea, the idea for the, for the book and the form sort of came at the same time, um, that the, it was the only way that I could think of telling I was also reading a lot of long poems, so maybe that's why I, I was, this is like, oh, this is the most exciting form and not the only <laughs> form I care about right now. Um, but it, but it, what the long poem allows for is um, to, to return over and over again to questions. It allows for open-ended narratives. It allows for lots of different voices and, um, and to be able to pull in you know, uh, I also, you know, quote from other long poems and other materials and letters, and it, you can kind of put these fragments together in a way that that makes a whole um, that I was really interested in. So, and and the other thing about a long poem that I was trying to figure out, the story that I was telling was all about migration, all about moving from a place to another place and maybe circling back a couple of times. Um, and to me, the the long poem form also enacts that um, migration. 
So, um, so yeah, the form, it, it, it sort of just, the idea fell into the form, I think. Um, and, and yeah, so, so for the research, I, uh, I was really lucky in that my uncle is a historian. So, um, so he had, so my, my Oma's brother um, was, he was conscripted into the German army and then was, after the war was taken as a prisoner of war um, to Siberia. And eventually he came back to Ukraine and he was 37 when he died. But before he died, he sent all these letters um, to my Oma where she, when she was living back in Manitoba. And so my uncle translated all of these letters, which really helped me understand sort of the syntax. Um, it helped me understand some, some context. Um, and it, I think, yeah, that kind of, um, those, those sources, I don't know if it, I mean, it was, it all felt new. I, I had always known my Oma's story, but it was sort of told um, in a triumphant way or something. It was this, it was this great family myth of like, wow, Oma got out <laughs> and then, and then she got to come here and make us, you know, <laughs> um, and, uh, and that was sort of the legacy. And, and I, and I hadn't, thought to question, you know, what has she actually experienced? Because she didn't, she didn't talk about it at all, right? And what did, what did she go through? And what was she carrying with her the whole time that she was here? And, and so I think all that research helped me to, to, to know, know her better. Yeah. Yeah, you can follow up, please. Yeah, I have a follow-up question. <laughs> um, okay, because I happen to know your family. So that's, um, Sarah comes from a family of many famous historians, um, and uh, and they're all men, and the, the the famous historians are all men. But I have written many famous historical books and, and stuff, and uh, and so the way they have to I mean, have been influential teachers for many people. So, but the way they have told the story is, you know, not only male centered but very patriarchal. And uh, and very uh, and like from the inside, like the Christian. So uh, so I've always been curious. I've been meaning to ask you this question all this time. So I'm going to ask. <laughs> you know how how hard was it to to uh, reach all that story in the feminine? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways um i i was hoping that this book would would be some sort of intervention into that i i thought because my oma never told her story and even the only written account that i have of her story is written by my opa yeah. um and she never talked about it and and uh and yeah i think i i was just realizing how much silence there was and and how much of there was it wasn't complete any of this narrative you know um because it was it was so often told from this one perspective so i think that was um yeah that that fueled my my desire to to do this this speaking um yeah and i think the other the other piece of it is that um it was mostly women and children who came over um after the war um, because all the men had been um, taken, and uh, and but when they arrived in Manitoba, none of them could talk about what they had gone through. Partially because there wasn't really a no one was going to therapy, um, and there wasn't really like a language there. Um, but also, but also because the the church wouldn't allow it, and um, and wouldn't make space for it, and these all these male leaders in the community had no idea how to talk about you know sexual violence or trauma or any of that and so I, it just felt like yeah there were all these stories that that never um that were never really shared and because of that never like some of that healing it can't really occur so anyway that was yeah i think i it was it was an inter intervention nice Oh, it sure was. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's brave, very brave. Shall we wrap up with? Uh, I know it's a huge, huge. Diane, please. Thank you all, and it was very beautifully done. But um, for Di, I I want to know what the bees said. 
How did they respond to that? <laughs> so Diane's asking, what did the bees say? How did they respond to Diane's poem? They put this really beautiful lace all over all over the. But what she did was she she so there's like I don't know seven eighteen lines I think in the poem or something like that, and she had she put them onto these wooden panels like this, uh, one line on each panel. Uh, in braille, and then put and painted them with beeswax so that they would come and add their lace, and they they did that. And they and and then it was exhibited at a gallery. And so the the uh, these little plates were were sort of uh, displayed all over. You had to walk all the way around the region. And it smelled so nice, and and sometimes sometimes there were little leaves or petals or. Or little dead bodies of, or, 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 or a wing or something. And sometimes they covered up a word. And um, I think they liked it. <laughs> I like their reply anyway, a lot. <laughs> you said that, that, that the bees really changed your poetic practice. Also, Ah, uh, because like I said, I wanted to be that that was in the that was in the midst of my what you called my just my book of despair, which was book, which was really more a book of fear, I think, because um, you know, I've been through two big culture shocks in my life. First one was going from my medieval village, barefoot village to a modern city. I'm like, oh, that's what they do in cities. So oh. and that took me like you know a decade. Thompson always said it took him a, it was a 10-year blur learning how to live in the city of Winnipeg after growing up up north and I thought and I heard him say that I was like, yeah, it was a 10-year blur for me as well. It was just like it was everything was so completely different. And then my second big culture shock was moving to Southern Ontario, where I lived for a decade. I was teaching at the University of Win uh, Windsor. And, um, you know, it's the most polluted spot in North America. It's the most, like, it's so urban and so industrialized and all those highways and all the all the vectors that all come together right there in that spot. And I was I was really just really scared for, I don't know, I don't have a terribly robust immune system. I was just really scared of dropping dead. <laughs> and um, you know, so, and 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 that's when I, but that's when I sort of woke up to the the direness of the environmental crisis. Nobody was really writing about it, not in poetry. Even like Oryx and Crate came out the same year as my book. Now you care, and I was like, well, what's she writing about? It's like, and people said, you know, why are you talking about this? Like, you know, why do you have to be so negative? And I was like, isn't it better to talk about it than to not talk about it? And uh, so it was, uh, so that book was actually very, it was very popular in Ontario and it sort of woke up a lot of people and brought in the, the eco poetic into, into everybody's poetics there, in, just in a, in a different kind of attention than it had been than it had been before. And so, uh, yeah, there was a kind of, uh, well, big worry anyway. And then, like I say, when I was writing this poem, I that was in the middle of that bad awakening, and I, was, I would come back to Winnipeg in the summertime to clear out my mouth so I could go and do do it for another year. And um, and so, uh, but like I said, I was trying to figure out what is the right response. And and see, I see, I I worked at it really hard for a long time earlier than some other people. So everybody's talking about it now. Like everybody's talking about it. Everybody's like has this equal anxiety and a lot of young people are writing you know this dystopian fiction under the influence of Margaret Atwood I guess and uh and so I was tempted to go that way but I think I wanted but I but I think the bees sort of put me on a different path which is you know what are you adding to the situation what are you investing in we we need to reimagine the world we need to we need to become a body again we have to get our feedback on the ground and and so uh and so um and to you know practice joy that's a joyful thing so uh to bring yeah to bring sweetness and sweetness and dance and to the night exactly the world. so that was that's, the, that's why when i use the d word i also <laughs> coupled it with love <laughs> it was a challenge i know <laughs> but that's what i think you both come back to again and again is your great great love 
comes to being on this earth and being grounded on the earth. I think we could talk for a long time. Just want to say thank you both. This has been absolutely wonderful. I hope I'm not uh, interrupting anybody with a question. All right. I know we're gone over time. <laughs> thank you. I love you both. Your books are absolutely beautiful. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again to Di Grant, Sarah Enns, and Catherine Lawrence, and to everyone at Turnstone Press. And thank you all for coming tonight. Have a good evening. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> so beautiful.